Hello and welcome to the 1800 Respect webinar, More Than Revenge Pornography, the prevalence, impacts and available responses to image-based abuse in Australia. Thank you for joining us. Our webinar today is being presented on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation and we wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners. We would also like to pay our respects to the elders, past and present, and the elders from other communities who may be present today. 1800 Respect is a confidential information, counselling and support service that is open 24 hours a day, every day of the year, to support people impacted by sexual assault, domestic or family violence and abuse. People can access the service by phoning 1800 737 732 or visiting 1800respect.org.au. Today's 1800 Respect webinar will provide an overview on the prevalence and impacts of image-based abuse, as well as the current legal and non-legal responses available to those who have experienced image-based abuse in Australia, including advice on having the image removed with or without legal intervention. Whilst it's developed for workers and professionals in Australia, the content of today's webinar will also be of use to those who have experienced image-based abuse or know someone who has. Please note this webinar is live and interactive and we will try to answer as many of your questions at the end of this presentation as possible. We are now very pleased to welcome our presenters. Today joining us we have Dr Asha Flynn, Senior Lecturer in Criminology, School of Social Sciences, Monash University, and Dr Nicola Henry, Associate Professor and Vice-Chancellor's Principal Research Fellow, Centre for Global Research, RMIT University. A very warm welcome to you both. It is now my pleasure to hand over to Dr Flynn to start the presentation. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today about image-based abuse. My name is Asha Flynn and my colleague Nicola Henry and I will be talking today about some of the issues around image-based abuse. Our aim in the time that we have today is to provide you with some additional information about image-based abuse, including the prevalence, nature and harms of image-based abuse, and importantly, the legal and non-legal responses available to those who experience it. The webinar today is informed by a Criminology Research Council funded project that we've recently completed. Those involved, um, this involved conducted interviews with 52 stakeholders, many of whom are at the front line of responding to those who experience image-based abuse in South Australia, Victoria and New South Wales. The interviews were conducted from April 2016 to October 2017. We also ran a national survey with almost 4,300 respondents aged 16 to 49 years, examining experiences with image-based abuse, both in terms of victimisation and perpetration. This was the first national study of its kind. Today we will draw on this data to help inform our discussion. We wanted to start today by briefly talking about terminology. Revenge pornography is a media generated term that is widely understood as the sharing or distribution of nude or sexual images by jilted ex-lovers whose primary motivations are revenge or retribution. While this term has been helpful in raising attention to this issue as it is a somewhat salacious and a bit catchier uh, term than the non-consensual distribution of nude or sexual images or image-based abuse. There are a number of good reasons why we should reject the term revenge porn, including that the term is a misnomer and only captures a very narrow set of behaviours. For instance, the term doesn't capture the different range of motivations beyond that of revenge. For example, blackmail and extortion, control, sexual gratification, voyeurism, social status building and monetary gain. The focus of revenge porn is narrowly on the non-consensual distribution of images, which means the term fails to address other forms of image-based abuse, such as the non-consensual taking of intimate images, for example, upskirting, downblousing, or surreptitious filming in public or private places, or the threats of distribution. It also likens non-consensual images to the production of commercial pornography, when many images that are shared without consent have very little in common with mainstream porn. 
It minimises the harm done to those who experience image-based abuse and has victim-blaming connotations because it implies the person was complicit in the creation of pornography. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, the term focuses attention on the content of the image rather than on the abusive actions of the perpetrators who misuse nude or sexual images. From our perspective, this isn't a case of mere semantics. The term revenge porn could, for example, be a deterrent to people coming forward to report their experiences. The term may also lead to problematic attitudes and beliefs within the community that blame victims for their actions. For these reasons, we prefer the term image-based abuse. Image-based abuse includes three main behaviours. It includes the non-consensual taking of a nude or sexual image, including images that are photoshopped or digitally manipulated to include the person's face in a sexually explicit situation. It includes this non-consensual distribution of nude or sexual images. And finally, the threat to distribute nude or sexual images. Image-based abuse is a very complex phenomenon that may take place in the context of domestic violence, sexual violence, among intimate partners or ex-partners, acquaintances, work colleagues, family members and strangers. It can occur in public or private spaces. Some abusers will post identifying information about the person in the image and may encourage others to contact the person and post abusive comments alongside the image. In some cases, images are being created and or shared in closed private settings without the knowledge of the person depicted in the image. Abusers may also try to blackmail or extort money by threatening to share a person's intimate image. Some images may initially be obtained consensually. So for example, images shared during the course of an intimate relationship. It becomes abuse when there is a lack of consent for images to be taken and or shared or when the abuser threatens to share the image with others. Images can also be obtained non-consensually through the hacking of computers and storage platforms or by coercion or threats which compel a person to send an image of themselves to the abuser. We wanted to briefly outline some examples of the different forms of image-based abuse that you may come across in your roles. In relation to the non-consensual creation or taking of intimate images, we've identified two examples on the slides here. The first involves a male secretly recording video footage of his three female housemates. The second involves a young woman whose work supervisor took non-consensual photographs of him touching her breasts. The non-consensual taking or creating of intimate images captures a range of situations where a person is photographed or filmed without their consent in both public and private settings. This form of image-based abuse can involve the secret filming of sexual encounters in intimate relationships, sometimes in the context of domestic violence, as well as the secret recording of primarily women in various contexts. The second category of image-based abuse is the most likely to fit within the revenge pornography label. Our participants describe this form of image-based abuse as the act of sharing nude or sexual images on social media and email without consent, often by ex-partners, to get revenge. This is evident in the first example on the slide involving a woman whose ex-partner had posted images of her online. A disturbing trend identified by participants in this category was the potential for stalking and further abuse of those who experienced image-based abuse, as the images were often accompanied by the person's personal details, such as their residential address and phone number. Yet these revenge cases represent only the tip of the iceberg, with many participants describing scenarios where the perpetrator was not a current or former partner, or in fact motivated by revenge. Several participants described non-consensual images being shared of women from the sex industry, for example, as demonstrated in the second uh, snippet on the slide. Participants identified two main ways in which perpetrators use threats as a form of image-based abuse, by coercing people into taking images or by threatening to distribute images to force the person in the image to engage in an unwanted act, such as paying money, blackmail, performing a sexual act, or preventing the person from leaving an intimate relationship. This was the most widely discussed category of image-based abuse among our participants, and it commonly occurred in the domestic violence context. Although participants most commonly discuss threats in the context of intimate, personal and abusive relationships, they also identified this category of image-based abuse in relation to online dating scams. The wide range of examples provided by participants suggests that image-based abuse is a highly complex phenomenon, encompassing different behaviours, abusers and contexts, 
a range of technological tools or artefacts and intersecting social and cultural factors that shape how these acts and harms translate into attitudes, beliefs, norms and values. We wanted to quickly run a poll here to see how many of you have experienced or come across individuals who have experienced one of these different forms of image-based abuse. We'll just cut to that poll now. The idea of this is to see the different types of contexts in which we're seeing image-based abuse occurring. There we go. Thanks, sorry. Technical issues getting the poll up. Yeah, so we can see here from the examples coming in that we're actually seeing all of the above being the most common form. So we are seeing examples of all three of these in the in people that you're experiencing. Okay, might move on to the next. Thank you for that information. Okay, so we wanted to move on now to look at the prevalence from our results, from our national survey that we conducted with approximately 4,300 Australians aged 16 to 49. So we found overall that one in five participants, or around 23%, reported having experienced at least one form of image-based abuse. Most common was sexual and nude images being taken of them without the consent, with one in five reporting these experiences. Also common were nude or sexual images being sent on to others or distributed without consent, with approximately 11% or 1 in 10 reporting these experiences. 9% of our survey participants had experienced a threat to send a nude or sexual image. We also asked our female participants about upskirting and down blousing images, where either images of their cleavage or up their skirt were taken, distributed or threatened to be distributed. One in 10 women said that someone had taken an image of their cleavage without their permission, and one in 20 said someone had taken an image of their skirt without permission. Looking at these figures, it is important to remember, of course, that these are only the prevalence rates where people have become aware that someone was taking or sharing these images without their consent. So the actual rate of victimisation is likely to be much higher. One only has to scratch the surface of content shared online to identify that there are many more sites and platforms dedicated to sharing women's nude or sexual images without their consent. Identifying these sites and the ways in which they operate is an important avenue for future research. We recently completed a project funded by the Office of the eSafety Commissioner to examine the sites of distribution of image-based abuse. And while we're not able to discuss the findings of this research yet, it certainly sheds light on the gendered nature of image-based abuse and of the online subcultures trading in the nude and sexual images of women in particular. Overall, we found that men and women experienced similar rates of image-based abuse. However, we've recently completed another survey with the Office of the eSafety Commissioner where the rates were significantly higher for women than men in experiencing victimisation. And I also just wanted to point out here the reports of victimisation to police in Victoria, where we can see a much higher number of women than men are reporting image-based abuse victimisation in this state. Approximately 10 times the amount of reports come from women. Some groups within the Australian community were more likely than others to report ever having experienced image-based abuse. And you can see these figures on the slide involving Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, lesbian, gay and bisexual respondents, respondents with a disability and young people. These findings reflect patterns of abuse and harassment in our community more broadly, whereby groups that experience inequality and discrimination are at greater risk of multiple forms of victimisation. Another finding that is really important to note here is that even among those who said they'd never, never consensually sent or been pressured to send someone else a sexual self-image, one in 10 still reported 
experiencing image-based abuse. Now, this can be understood in light of the finding that these individuals reported experiencing someone taking a nude or a sexual image of them without their consent images which themselves might later be distributed or threatened to be distributed. So while sending sexual self images might increase the risk that those images are misused, not sending sexual selfies is by no means a guaranteed protection against image-based abuse. Our survey found that those who'd experienced image-based abuse were almost twice as likely as those who hadn't to ex report experiencing high levels of psychological distress. These impacts were highest for those who'd experienced threats to distribute an image, of whom 80% reported high levels of psychological distress consistent with a diagnosis of moderate to severe depression and or anxiety disorders. These are very important findings as they demonstrate for the first time the serious nature of the harm that is felt by those who report experiencing image-based abuse. Many also reported that they were very or extremely fearful as a result uh, for their safety as a result of experiencing image-based abuse. There were important differences in fear experienced by women as compared to men. For example, women were significantly more likely than men to report feeling afraid for their safety. I'm now going to move on to Nicola Henry, who's going to talk to you about some of the legal and non-legal responses available. Thanks, Asha. So um, I'm going to be talking um, about the criminal offences before then moving on to discussing available civil remedies to um, instances of image-based abuse. To date, four jurisdictions in Australia have introduced specific criminal offences that have been designed to tackle image-based abuse. They include Victoria, South Australia, New South Wales and the ACT. In 2013, South Australia was the first jurisdiction to introduce specific criminal offences to deal with the non-consensual distribution of invasive images. In 2016, South Australia amended, um, made amendments to its law to also criminalise the non-consensual uh, threats to share invasive images. The penalty for the non-consensual distribution of invasive images in South Australia is two years and two years maximum prison imprisonment, and the maximum penalty for threats to share those images in South Australia is one year. Then in 2014, uh, uh, Victoria became the second jurisdiction to introduce specific offences, making it a criminal offence to um, non-consensually distribute intimate images uh, with a maximum penalty of two years imprisonment and um, also making it a criminal offence to make threats to share those images with a maximum penalty of one year imprisonment. More recently, in August 2017, both New South Wales and the ACT um, also introduced new laws to criminalise image-based abuse behaviours. So in New South Wales, for instance, there are now three new criminal offences. One refers to the non-consensual distribution of intimate images. The second refers to the non-consensual taking or creation of nude or sexual images. And the third refers to the non-consensual um, uh, the, sorry, the, the making threats to share those images. Um, all three new offences attract a maximum penalty of three years in New South Wales. And also in August 2017, the ACT introduced similar legislation um, that also prohibits um, similar acts with maximum penalty of up to three years in prison. Um, so one thing to note with the New South Wales and ACT legislation is that, um, which does sit as a, a aside or apart from the Victorian and South Australian legislation is that a court, um, if, a, if a court finds a perpetrator guilty of an offence, of one of those new offences, um, then they can actually order that person um, to take reasonable steps to remove, delete, destroy, um, etc. those images and failure to do so in New South Wales at least will result in a maximum penalty of two years. Um, it's also interesting to note just in those jurisdictions without, um, sorry, with specific legislation in place in Australia, um, is there's not a requirement to prove that the offender intended to cause harm or distress to the victim, and there's no requirement um, that the court prove or the prosecution prove um, that the uh, the person who had experienced image-based abuse did in fact um, experience um, serious distress or or another form of harm. Uh, 
other jurisdictions in Australia don't currently have specific offences in place. So, for instance, North, Northern, um, Northern Territory, um, Queensland, Tasmania and Western Australia don't have specific offences, um, but they can rely on broader offences um, such as stalking, um, surveillance devices um, legislation or voyeurism offences. However, um, we've argued in the work that we've done that um, it's important to have specific offences in place for image-based abuse behaviour and all of those remaining jurisdictions do have um, some laws that they are currently considering. So I think in 2018 we'll see some changes happening in those other jurisdictions. In, ad uh, in addition, uh, we currently don't have a specific criminal offence at the federal level in Australia. Um, we do have the telecommunications law under the criminal code, which makes it a criminal offence to use a carriage service to menace, harass or cause offence. However, this legislation is overly broad. Um, it's not always that well used. Um, it has been used in relation to some instances of image-based abuse. Um, but what we would argue is that um, there should be a specific criminal offence at the federal level um, because at the moment we do have a patchwork of inconsistent laws in Australia. We don't have that those laws at the federal level. We don't have laws in place in um, some jurisdictions um, and we do believe that having those offences in place does um, send a very strong message to the community uh, that image-based abuse is abhorrent and that the community takes it seriously. But in saying all of this, it's really important to note that um, while the criminal law is a really important avenue for addressing image-based abuse in Australia, it's not the only um, method or measure um, in which we should be addressing um, or preventing image-based abuse from happening. Um, so it's really important to consider other legal mechanisms such as civil courts, tribunals and complaint handling mechanisms, which may in fact be more successful and more efficient in terms of um, providing um, efficient and effective remedies for um, vict um, people who have experienced image-based abuse. So now I'm going to just uh, talk about some civil remedies that are available to people who have experienced image-based abuse. Uh, we have um, uh, laws relating to copyright breach, uh, breach of confidence, anti-discrimination law, defamation and so on. Um, unfortunately, those civil laws are ill-suited um, to tackle image-based abuse violations. So, for instance, in anti-discrimination law, there is a requirement, for instance, under Australian sexual harassment legislation um, that behaviours must occur um, in a specified area of public life. Um, however, given that um, most acts of image-based abuse are more likely to um, appear in a kind of private context by private individuals, that type of legislation won't easily apply to cases of image-based abuse. Copyright also requires that the, um, the person owns the image. So if a person hasn't, has, if someone else has taken the image of them and then shared it around, um, they won't be considered to be the copyright owner and therefore won't have remedies under Australian copyright law. Uh, the other thing too in Australia is we have very weak protections against privacy invasions. Um, currently there is no statutory cause of action for an invasion of privacy for individuals in Australia. So essentially, although the civil law is an important avenue for addressing image-based abuse and there have been some su successful cases where uh, litigants have sued um, their perpetrators in court and have had some good responses and some good outcomes, um, the problem is that civil law is um, it's ill suited in its applicability and its language. It doesn't uh, adequately capture the harms of image-based abuse. Um, for instance, a violation of dignity, sexual autonomy, um, and also as a serious invasion of one's privacy. The second um, point about civil remedies is that there are significant costs associated with um, pursuing um, a, a case in a civil court. Um, so those who don't have the financial means will just not have that option available to them. Arguably as well, the civil law uh, privatises the issue of image-based abuse and doesn't serve as an effective deterrent against future behaviour. Another reason why civil law, in addition to criminal law, might not be the kind of appropriate solution is that it can't uh, stop the spread of um, the, the nude or the sexual images 
images once they've been distributed online. So even if takedown powers are given to courts and other agencies, it still can't prevent um, the, the, the massive spread of images in some cases. Uh, and um, I do want to just give an example of um, some jurisdictions internationally um, that have um, empowered courts or external agencies to issue takedown notices that require an organisation or an individual to remove the images, which may include additional criminal offences for failure to comply with the takedown order. So just to give you one example of the New Zealand um, civil scheme, in New Zealand under the harmful digital communications legislation, um, the government agency called NetSafe is charged with the responsibility of resolving um, complaints on behalf of complainants. The legislation also gives the New Zealand District Court powers to issue takedown orders and impose penalties on those who do not comply. Um, the problem is in those cases that where NetSafe is unable to resolve the complaint on behalf of the complainant, the complainant must then proceed to the New Zealand District Court if they want to see any kind of legal action, if they want those images removed. And they must use their own resources um, to do so. Now, in New Zealand, technically, it's actually free to go to the New Zealand uh, District Court and to request to have those images removed. Um, however, if the um, defendant has their own legal representation, um, however, if the um, defendant has their own legal representation and the complainant doesn't have legal representation, then there could potentially be an imbalance of power um, and problems with equality before the law. And the other problem too is that in the New Zealand District Court, um, the uh, the processes are very time consuming and so there is not going to be the likelihood of having those images removed in a quick and efficient manner. So now let me move on to talking just briefly about the proposed civil penalty scheme in Australia because I think that's got a lot of promise. Um, in mid-2017 uh, there were consultations that were took place regarding uh, amending the Enhancing Online Safety Act um, to include civil penalty scheme for image-based abuse behaviours. So currently the legislation gives the Office of the eSafety Commissioner powers to investigate online bullying and harassment of children and impose civil penalties on those posting or hosting offensive content. But this isn't currently in relation to adults. But with the proposed civil penalty scheme, which we're yet to see come into effect, um, there are proposals that that scheme would include things like uh, formal warnings, infringement notices, and enforceable undertakings and inju injunctions, as well as uh, removal notices to perpetrators, social media services and website and content hosts. So civil remedies overall do represent an important step, just in the same way that criminal justice responses are important to dealing with image-based abuse behaviour. Um, however, the law should not be seen as the only mechanism for, for addressing uh, image-based abuse. So I'm now going to highlight some of the key challenges in terms of responding uh, to image-based abuse. Several participants in our study provided examples where police had advised them that those who had experienced image-based abuse, that there was nothing that they could do and provided unhelpful advice such as telling them to turn off their phone or to deactivate their social media accounts. And this outcome was so common for one participant that she said she provides her clients with a printed version of the relevant legislation to take to the police counter when reporting the offence. Also in, relation to, also in addition to not understanding the image-based laws, several participants suggested that some police lacked the basic knowledge of the internet, particularly social media, and as a result did not know how to address the issue. Even when police demonstrated awareness of image-based abuse laws and had some uh, technological knowledge of social media, for instance, Almost all participants pointed to the monetary constraints and the availability or unavailability of technical equipment um, in terms of being able to investigate and proceed with a, um, a, a criminal case. There was also the consistent view that police prioritise investing resources into contact or physical offences as opposed to the so-called virtual harms uh, that, that many experience in relation to image-based abuse. And this is despite most participants acknowledging the great damage that can be caused um, by image-based abuse. 
The range of barriers to prevent individuals from reporting image-based abuse, including the reluctance to share images with police. So one of our participants, Maki, for instance, described this as the idea of having to share images with a stranger who may or may not respond appropriately to an or an office, potentially an office of people who will look and assess the images. Several participants also reflected on diversity, cultural background, sexuality and disability as fueling a lack of trust towards police, thereby creating further barriers to reporting image-based abuse. And linked to reporting barriers, participants also identified limitations in the criminal justice pathway as an appropriate response to image-based harms. For many who experience image-based abuse, they may just want this all to go away. They may not want to bring attention to the images in the first place, not just with police, but also with um, friends and family members, um, and also in particular perpetrator. So for instance, some people who have experienced image-based abuse will worry about the repercussions, not only of being blamed for having taken the image or letting someone take the image, but also that they may experience retribution or revenge from, a, from the perpetrator, who may then go ahead and share those images more broadly. Consistent across all these viewpoints was a concern about blaming the person who had experienced image-based abuse um, in this situation. Unfortunately, in our study, many Australians um, how, did hold victim blaming or harm minimisation attitudes in re response to image-based abuse. So, for example, in our survey, 70% said that someone, or sorry, 70% agreed with the statement that people should know better than to take nude selfies in the first place. We also found that 62% of our study respondents agreed with the statement that if a person sends a nude or a sexual image to someone else, then they're at least partly responsible if the image ends up online. And these attitudes were held by one in two men, one in three women, over 70% of male perpetrators and just under 60% of female perpetrators. And in the final few minutes um, that I have, I just want to talk about some of the uh, other ways in which we can be responding um, to image-based abuse behaviours. So let me start by talking about the Office of the eSafety Commissioner. Um, the office has a, an online portal that went live in October in 2017. So now people can um, report image-based abuse to the Office of the eSafety Commissioner who will provide advice and support in terms of getting the images removed. They will provide guidance in terms of how to communicate with someone who has um, intimate images um, of, of that person. Um, and that service is available to anyone who has experienced image-based abuse. The, uh, there's also an interesting and somewhat controversial new um, pilot um, initiative um, in con Facebook in conjunction with the Office of the eSafety Commissioner. Um, uh, basically now an able um, a person who's worried or concerned that a person might uh, share intimate images of them on Facebook as well as Facebook subsidiaries like Instagram, Messenger and WhatsApp. They can actually um, fill out a, an online form through the Office of the eSafety Commissioner. Then they can um, privately send that image to themselves through Messenger. A community operations analyst from Facebook will then get access to the image and create what's known as a hash of the image, which is essentially a unique digital finger, fingerprint. Then if the perpetrator does indeed attempt to upload or share that image on Facebook, they'll be automatically blocked and the image won't be able to be shared on Facebook and its subsidiaries. So basically once the hash has been created, the person will then be asked to delete the image from, um, um, from Messenger and then Facebook will go ahead and delete the image as well. Now the use of digital DNA is not new. This technology was first developed by Microsoft in 2009 to prevent child exploitation material from being circulated on the internet. The other thing to note too that if someone has indeed shared a, an intimate image, um, a photograph or a video on Facebook, they can make a report to Facebook, who will also, they'll also use their photo matching technology to prevent the image from appearing again on Facebook and its subsidiaries. But it's important to note that these measures won't prevent images being shared on other platforms. 
One of them too is that some um, people who've experienced image-based abuse may feel uncomfortable in terms of sending the image to themselves or giving Facebook representatives access to their images. There are other uh, corporate and social responsibility measures that um, have been put in place um, by uh, social media, online platforms and technology companies and um, search engines to try and um, deal with the problem of image-based abuse. So for instance, in 2015, Microsoft and Google announced new reporting options to those who'd experienced image-based abuse so that people who have had images um, shared online can contact those organisations and um, have the content involving them excluded from Bing or Google searches. Other companies such as Twitter, Reddit, Tumblr, Pornhub, Snapchat, Instagram and Flickr have also introduced reporting mechanisms and have policies in place prohibiting the distribution of non-consensual nude or sexual images. And you might be surprised to know that some of these so-called revenge porn or ex-girlfriend websites also have policies and or reporting procedures on their sites to deal with non-consensual distribution of nude or sexual images. However, those types of sites um, are obviously incredibly problematic, um, are unlikely to action any requests that um, people have experienced image-based abuse might make to those sites particularly given that a lot of, a lot of those sites um, deliberately actually invite people to not only share um, images of an ex-partner or, or, or a friend, um, but actually also invite um, those people to share other information about the persons depicted in the image, such as their phone number, their, their real names, uh, where they live, and so on and so forth. So obviously there, there are these, these measures, these corporate social responsibility measures aren't foolproof, um, but we have seen some action in the last few years in terms of prohibiting image-based abuse behaviours on these sites and taking action in some instances to, to address the problem. So in addition to, um, to, to those things, we, we also need to have education. We need to have education that doesn't focus on why the, the person who's depicted in the image decided to take the image of him or herself in the first place or why they let someone else take that image of them. We really need to do, have some really good educational programs um, designed to, to target perpetrators and the unethical and disrespectful behaviours that they engage in when they um, engage in image-based abuse behaviours. So just to sum up here, these are some things that we believe we need to do from here as a community. We need to provide information and support for those who have experienced image-based abuse, and that needs to be for a diversity of people. So young people, uh, people with disabilities, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians, um, people from diverse sexualities, people from culturally and linguistically diverse communities. As I've already mentioned, we need to have good community education and awareness and prevention programs that are designed to, to tackle this issue at its source. We need to have better resources for police so that they know about the laws, that they know how to respond, and then they're not going to engage in victim blaming behaviours, um, and that they do have those resources in place to um, investigate what can be often very time consuming and very expensive um, cases involving image based abuse behaviours. I've already talked about the, the, the need to improve those legal protections in both the civil and the criminal law. I've also talked about the work that needs to be done with the major social media and blogging platform providers um, to improve the action on removal requests. And finally, we need to make sure that those who are working with individuals who experience image-based abuse, as well as criminal justice authorities, have the adequate and proper training in place so that they understand the nature of the harms, the prevalence of image-based abuse, and what can be done to ensure that those who have experienced it get some kind of justice and some kind of adequate and quick and efficient outcome. Thanks. Okay, so we are um, now uh, at question time, and thank you so much. A number of you have posted some questions. Um, we're going to start with the first question. What advice would you give to someone who has experienced image-based abuse? What should they do? 
So what I would suggest there is the the, the first um, advice that I would give would be for to to direct a, a person to the office of the eSafety Commissioner, the online portal for image based abuse, which contains excellent information um, to to help a person um, know what to do, how to contact those organisations to make a request, what's needed, um, and those you know whether it's Twitter or whether it's Facebook or whether it's one of the the porn sites. Uh, they can also um, assist in terms of getting those images removed on behalf of the, the person making the complaint. It's also important um, that the person who's experienced image-based abuse um, preserves evidence, um, maybe through taking a screenshot, um, and, and, and the Office of the eSafety Commissioner portal has some really good advice on, on how to preserve that evidence should a police investigation um, be uh, something that the person who's experienced this um, desires to, to, to the path to go down. Um, another option for someone who's experienced image-based abuse, if they if they don't, they're not quite at that point of wanting to go further and make a complaint and talk to someone, because a lot of people just don't want to bring this up to anybody. Um, a person can actually do a reverse Google Images search, um, where you know they um, may discover where those images are being hosted, um, and then they might be able to contact those organisations to have that to make a request um, to have those images removed. And as I mentioned, most organisations, most online platforms and social media and even porn websites um, do actually have policies prohibiting the non-consensual sharing of intimate images. And, and some of them do have um, online request forms where a person can request that those images of, of them are removed from that site. Okay, thank you. We've got uh, lots more questions coming through at this time. So I'm just going to um, look at a couple of these and respond. So one of the questions is, what if the image was taken in a sexual context, but the actual image itself does not appear sexual? Now, in terms of um, responding uh, legally to this, it has been a big debate in new legislation that's been introduced as to how broad the definition should be. So in order to be able to capture um, intimate and, and sexual situations um, and also being you know culturally reflective and um, taking into account privacy so in terms of um, the image being taken in a sexual context but it might not appear sexual an example of this might be uh, someone using the toilet um, or a bathing or showering and these are captured by some of the legislation that we have um, but it doesn't extend to uh, examples where you can't expect a reasonable level of privacy. So for example, um, if you're at a nudist speech and a photograph is taken of you, there is a limited amount of privacy accepted in those situations. Another question that we have um, is that our research seems to cover data on people who are 16 years and over. Is there any data um, on younger people? Um, it is that there's been very little uh, research conducted on image-based abuse to date. Um, most of the research that has been done has been in the United States. Um, there has been a lot of research done around sexting, which focuses more on the consensual sending of intimate images between young people. But of the, the little research that we have come across um, that has focused on people under the age of 16, it is still a common occurrence that um, individuals are experiencing image-based abuse, and we'd say it is similar levels to what we've seen in the adult um, age groups. Nicola. So another question that's been posed to us is how can we as workers challenge the blaming of victims? This is a really important question. It's um, something that we get asked quite often and something that we ask also when we do research on this topic is how do you balance, how do you make a balance between giving advice and support to people who have experienced image-based abuse but at the same time you're not um, victim, engaging in victim blaming? And I know it's tricky. I mean, I think there's a difference between, say, um, if you're a parent um, giving advice to your child not to take nude or sexual images um, 
you know, for, for, the, for your child to engage in that behaviour, that, that's something quite different. I think that once once um, it, it's happened, once someone has taken those images, I don't think there's any point in saying, don't do that again. I think someone who has experienced this, who has had an image of them uh, taken without their consent or someone's shared those images without consent or someone's threatened to share those images, I think that the person probably full well knows, um, you know, that, that may be, um, you know, about, about the consequences of, 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 of that. And it's really best to focus on, okay, what do we do now? How do we, how do we manage, you know, how do we, how do we manage, manage this? How do we prevent the further spread of those images? What what kind of legal remedies are available to those who've experienced this? And as I said, there are a whole. Um, there's a, some great advice on the office of the eSafety Commissioner online portal um, that 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 will guide people who experience image-based abuse in, in the right direction. So I think we do need to be very careful about victim blaming. And unfortunately, some of the public awareness campaigns that we've had roll out in Australia and elsewhere um, have tended to focus on young women and their stupidity and na naivety in terms of uh, letting someone take an image of them or sharing an image. And that's why I think it's really important that we, we redirect that message, that we actually focus on, on those who engage in image-based abuse behaviours. Another question that another really, or they're all really great questions. Um, hopefully, we can get through a few more. But another question is around: What if the perpetrator is living overseas? Unfortunately, uh, owing to laws around, um, you know, the uh, owing to state sovereignty, and um, that that we, you know, the laws um, tend to operate for in Australia for Australians um, in terms of both um, the complainants and also defendants. Um, if a person has engaged in image-based abuse and they are located in another country, there's really not a lot that can be done um, because of the, law, the different laws that might operate in the, the, the perpetrator's um, country of origin. Um, but as we also discussed in this webinar, the, the, the law is not the only option. There are other ways to address this problem, uh, one of them being around um, the person who's experienced image-based abuse, perhaps contacting um, the, the, the website and, and requesting that those images are removed um, and, um, yeah, trying to, trying to seek some kind of alternative remedy. We do have um, collaborative of, um, a, a, a agreements in place in relation to child exploitation material, but we don't yet have that in place for, for image-based abuse behaviours against adults. But we may see some changes to that in the future. So another, a, a couple of questions have come in focusing on educating young people about the legislation. Um, are there child-friendly resources or how can we communicate the message to young people? And this is a key challenge and, and Nicola touched on it before in terms of the um, finding the appropriate responses that uh, focus on the perpetrator as opposed to the victim. It's very difficult in this day and age to tell a young person not to send sexual images of themselves um, to another because that is part of essentially dating, that's part of the way um, young people communicate nowadays. So in terms of developing effective education resources, it's something that we're looking into as a way that we can develop um, mechanisms that speak to young people, that engage with their language and their activities and that better represent their understandings of the situation. So unfortunately there isn't a huge amount out there. The campaigns that we have had that target young people in regards to sexting um, have not been very positively received. So it is a gap that we do need to address. Um, another question that we had was around how far off we are from a federal response to this. And look, we feel strongly that this is the most um, beneficial way to respond in terms of a legal response is to have federal legislation that can then be mirrored across the different states and territories. This was something that all our participants supported and um, has come up again and again as the way forward, that we need the federal government to send a strong message that this type of behaviour is not acceptable. We've just seen in the United States that Congress have passed a bill, the Enough Act, which is now going to criminalise um, image-based sexual abuse across all United States um, areas. So we're hoping that Australia will soon follow suit. There's been a number of reviews and reports completed over the past year, and we do feel uh, strongly that this will be the next step. So hopefully we're not too far off seeing this taken more seriously by the federal government. 
Nicola? And we've got um, time for maybe a couple more questions. Um, so uh, let me just have a look, sorry. Um, So someone asked about whether uh, what if the what if the image was secretly taken when the victim was showering, but the image of the person whose image was taken did not agree to the image, and the gym refuses to take down the image. So if it's a, a woman posing in a bikini, well, look, the 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 problem I guess with um, the legislation Ash has already mentioned this is that um, some jurisdictions have very narrowly crafted legislation. So the definition of, an, of intimate definition of intimate images, for instance, in Victoria. Is, um, includes kind of those sexual or nude images. So it's unlikely that a, an image of someone in bikini would um, be covered under Victorian legislation. Uh, some of the other jurisdictions have slightly broader legislation. As Asha also mentioned, they might include um, toileting or, um, or engage in another kind of uh, private act that might not necessarily be nude or sexual. Um, but again, the, the laws aren't crafted so broadly as to capture all forms of image-based abuse. And there are arguments both for and against that. The argument for that is that you know that we we don't want to try and um, have laws that are so broad that it, that they're useless, but we also don't want to have laws that are so narrow um, that they fail to capture all these different forms of image-based abuse. But I guess my response would be that you know it's, it's again going back to that point is that the law isn't the only way to address this issue, and for many. People have experienced image-based abuse. The law, in fact, is not a very good option for many people because they don't want people to know um, that someone has images of them, that there are images out there online. They don't want other people to search for those images. They don't want attention being brought to them. They don't want to experience retribution from um, a perpetrator for, for going down a criminal justice or a civil justice pathway. So going back to the question in terms of the, the a person who's had an image of them shared of you know their bikini at the gym, for instance, I think the best way is for that person to comment, you know, their bikini at the gym, for instance. I think the best way is for that person to contact uh, the manager at the gym, um, and uh, I'm sure that you know they would um, they would be more likely to to to, to take action on that um, if uh, if the manager's contacted uh, rather than a person at the desk. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, not all forms of image-based abuse um, are covered under Australian legislation. Um, but there are other ways to address this issue. And I think we've got time for one more question. Um, the, a question is, 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 the edu is education going to be part of police training in the future? Well, we don't know at this stage about what poli how police are kind of committed to um, further education on image-based abuse behaviours or what kind of resources will be invested. What we do know from the research that we've conducted is that police are overwhelmed in terms of investigating cybercrime more broadly, that they don't tend to define image-based abuse as cybercrime. Uh, so a lot of um, reports of image-based abuse are more likely not to go to the cybercrime units and, and to be funneled to um, local police stations. And obviously we, there are going to be diverse responses from police. Some police will be brilliant and will know about the legislation, will know about the harms and impacts and will, will give a very empathetic response to, to those who, who make a report. Um, but if police don't know about the legislation or if they're, they're not um, if they have those victim blaming attitudes, then then that's where the problem lies. So we do believe that education and training of police is absolutely vital. And now that we have seen the introduction of specific criminal offences in Australia, where in 2018 we're likely to see all states and territories, and hopefully the federal level, have um, those offences in place, that that will filter down, but it will eventually make a difference. And we hope that police training and resources will um, improve um, so that they can more adequately respond to reports of image-based abuse. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola and Asha, for your presentation, and thank you to everyone for attending the webinar. We wish you a pleasant afternoon.